I think it's clear President Trump is the right guy for the job because he did such a great job when he was there before. This is an attack on the guy who's who's fighting for us, who's fighting for the American people, fighting for this great country. And uh, I think it only strengthens, hardens and expands his support. With fervor in his voice, Jim Jordan makes a monumental declaration, asserting unequivocally that President Trump is the rightful leader for the nation. So that is a huge issue that has to be in the bill or we should not reauthorize FISA. It has to be in there. And certainly the evidence is piling up. All these you know, suspicious activity reports, the millions of dollars going to multiple members of the Biden family. Mr. Weiss has full authority to bring cases in other jurisdictions if he feels it's necessary. That was your response, Attorney General, to Senator Grassley's question on March 1st, 2023. You just referenced it when Mr. Bishop was questioning you. Only problem is he'd already been turned down by the U.S. Attorney in the District of Columbia, Mr. Graves. 60% of the American people think there's a double standard at the Justice Department. They think that because there is. And you can see that with what happens to Hunter Biden and, of course, what they've done to President Trump, not just eight days ago with, uh, with the arraignment and the indictment, but what they've done to him for seven years. Jim Jordan unveils the contents of three crucial letters, each painting a different narrative and shedding light on a tangled web of intrigue and deception. The fundamental question is, if he already had the authority, why does he need the authority? I mean, that, that, that to me makes no sense, but that's exactly what he tried to say. Oh, no, he had it all along, but I still had to make him a special counsel. So I don't get it. The three letters they sent to us this summer, two to our committee, one to Senator Graham, tell three different stories. And the, the point I always make is the story who's been consistent has been the two whistleblowers. So the position we've taken is the reasonable Republican position, the common sense position. The Democrats have taken the default position, frankly. So I do think we're gonna get a lot here. And really what we're saying, if we get this, Stuart, what, what Speaker McCarthy and Republicans want is let's spend less this year than we spent last year. So people see that the scary thing for me is it's not just about the president going after President Trump. It's going after parents at school board meetings. If you're a pro-life Catholic, you're an extremist. If, if you're a journalist, for goodness sake, they went after Matt Taibbi. So that's the big overall overarching concern is this double standard that the American people now see clearly and know that, know that it exists. Chairman Turner brought this forward yesterday. It's obviously something that I think we need to view as in a serious matter. I guess my first thought was, you know, that thank goodness President Trump started Space Force when you when you hear about what they're talking. Jake Sullivan is going to brief, not me today, but he'll be briefing the, uh, you know, the top people on the Intel Committee and, and what's called the Gang of Eight, the leaders in both the House and Senate. Uh, so I think they'll know more today after that, uh, that briefing. But, um, you know, serious issue. Uh, but yesterday, primarily, as I, uh, you know, I, I spent most of the day yesterday trying to trying to figure out this FISA law, which is up for reauthorization, and particularly the protections Americans need when the government, the United States government, the federal government is going to be looking at their data. We think you have to have a warrant before you do that. And so we're fighting to make sure that gets done over the next several weeks as part of this FISA reauthorization. Delving into matters of national security. Jim Jordan paints a dear picture of the threats facing the country, working swift and decisive action. You know, think of the comparison in four years. We, we literally went from a secure border to no border. We went from safe streets to record levels. of. We went from $2 gas to three, four, five dollar gas. And maybe most importantly, we went from stable prices to record inflation. And I haven't even gotten into foreign policy where we had in President Trump someone who projected strength and was respected around the world to Joe Biden and and Russia and Hezbollah attacking our best friend, the state of and of course what China's, I mean, so that, that is what this is about. The elections are about a contrast and a comparison and about which side you're gonna be. I think it's clear President Trump is the right guy for the job because he did such a great job when he was there before. Amidst revelations of FBI misconduct, Jim Jordan demands accountability, insisting that the same standards be applied rigorously to uphold the integrity of the justice system. This is the FBI that spied on the presidential campaign. This is the FBI that censored Americans. This is the FBI that said pro-life Catholics were extremists and we're gonna let them police themselves. No, you gotta have, a, the way our system works is there are separate and equal branches of government and you can't just have the executive branch police themselves. You have to go to another branch of government, the judicial branch to get a probable cause warrant. That happens all the time, every single day in this country. Mm -hmm. That is a standard we've had around since the place started. So let's make sure that same standard exists, particularly when we 
know that the FBI abused this process 278,000 times. They didn't follow their rules and yeah. properly queried this database. So that is a huge issue that has to be in the bill or we should not reauthorize FISA. It has to be in there. Well, he, I mean, he's in a fight for a second, I guess, because this, you know, President Trump's going to win. I think he's going to win big. And I think, as he said at the rally today, this is not only going to send a message for New Hampshire and South Carolina, but I think a message for the for the whole country. I think he's going to be our nominee. More importantly, I think he's, President Trump's going to be the next president. Um, you know, I leave that up to, to to Ron DeSantis. He's a good man. I served with him in Congress when we formed the Freedom Caucus. There were nine of us, and he was part of the original nine. So I have nothing against him. I just know the right guy for the for the job is President Trump. And that's why I've been 110 percent behind him from the get go. In a startling revelation, Jim Jordan discusses the potential ramifications of a Georgia judge's decision on Trump's legal case, underscoring the gravity of the situation. Yeah, she used taxpayer dollars to, to help Nathan Wade, who spent it in all kinds of ways. But he also used that money to go after President Trump, for goodness sake. So, yeah, that, I think she's compromised. And back up a second. She charged President Trump and 18 other people and was looking to charge three United States senators. She put this out, including the top Republican on the Senate Judiciary Committee. And now we find out, and we're talking to this individual, now we find out there's a whistleblower in the Fulton County DA's office who says that Fannie Willis also missed spent federal funds. Wow. That's why we've subpoenaed Ms. Willis for information related to that and other issues. We want to know what's going on here, but she sure looks like she's been compromising this entire ridiculous effort that she undertook several months ago. Jim Jordan raises probing questions about Attorney General Garland's actions, questioning why the statute of limitations was allowed to lapse in critical cases. Here's why the statute of limitations question is important that Mr. Bishop was getting at just a few minutes ago. Here's why it's important. You let the statute of limitations lapse for 2014, 2015. Those were the years with the felony tax charges where Hunter Biden was getting uh, income from Burisma. Here are four facts that I think are so important. Hunter Biden was put on the board of Burisma, made a lot of money, got paid a lot of money over those years, a couple million bucks. He wasn't qualified. Fact number two, he wasn't qualified to be on the board of Burisma. Not my words, his words. He said he got on the board because of his last name. The brand, as Devin Archer said when he was under oath and we deposed him. Fact number three, Burisma executives told Hunter Biden, we're under pressure, we need help. Fact number four, Joe Biden goes to leverages our tax money, American people's tax money, to get the prosecutor fired who was applying the pressure. Interestingly enough, that fact is entirely consistent with what the confidential human source told the FBI and they recorded in the 1023 form. The same form Mr. Ray didn't want to let this committee and the Congress see. That all happened. That all happened. What I'm wondering is why you guys let the statute of limitations lapse for those tax years that dealt with Burisma income. There's one more fact that's important and that is that this investigation was being conducted by Mr. Weiss an appointee of President Trump. You will, at the appropriate time, have the opportunity to ask Mr. Weiss that question, and he will no doubt address it in the public report that will be transmitted to the Congress. I don't know the answer to did those questions. Did they forget? Did the lawyers just like let it, did they just like, oh, darn, we let it, did they, were they careless? I expect that won't be what he says, but because I you promise- You know that's not the case, because as Mr. Bishop pointed out, they had a tolling agreement. With a keen eye for detail, Jim Jordan scrutinizes the decisions made by key figures, demanding transparency and accountability at every turn. Their testimony has not wavered, and they, they were subjected to about three hours of cross-examination from Democrats in the Oversight Committee back in July. Never forget, on July 10, David Weiss tells Senator Graham, I have not sought special counsel authority. Then on August 11th, the Attorney General, uh, General announces that David Weiss will be a special counsel. What happened in those 32 days? What took place? The whistleblowers came forward with their testimony and the plea deal that they were trying to sweep everything under the rug. The plea deal is declined by a judge who did her job. And that's why we got a special counsel. They were going to get away with all this, but for those two brave whistleblowers and that judge in Delaware who did her job. Discussing the role of a special counsel, Jim Jordan emphasizes the importance of extending investigations to uncover the truth and deliver justice. 
they talk to Hunter Biden's defense counsel and say, let's extend the statute of limitations. And then at some point they made an intentional decision to say, we're going to let the statute of limitations lapse. And I want to know who decided that and why they did it. Mr. Weiss was a supervisor of the investigation at that time and at all times. He made the necessary appropriate decisions. You'll be able to ask him that question and he will. You know why they did it. Everyone knows why they did it. May not say it, but everyone knows why they did it. They didn't, but risk those tax years, that's that, that dealt with the, pre, that involved the president. It's one thing to have a charge in Delaware, that doesn't involve the president of the United States. But Burisma, oh my, that goes right to the White House. We can't have that. And we can slow walk this thing along. We can even extend the statute of limitations and then we can intentionally let it lapse. And we know this investigation was slow. Here's what everyone said. Shapley said, DOJ slow walked the investigation. Ziegler, slow walking in the approvals of everything. This happened at the Delaware's attorney's office and DOJ tax level. Mr. Sobosinski, the FBI agent said, I would have liked to th see things move faster. Ms. Holly said the same. Every witness we've talked to said this thing was slow walked and we know why. It was slow walked it long enough to let the statute of limitations run so they wouldn't have to get into Burisma. Well, you would think particularly when supposedly David Weiss goes, and this is a testimony we've got, David Weiss goes to the U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia and he declines to allow him to prosecute there. You would think the attorney general would weigh in then, but it looks like he didn't. Now he's weighing in with the special counsel. The other thing I think is happening here in this third plan, I think the special counsel allows them to extend this out even further. So we'll see what that all means. David Weiss is scheduled to be in front of our committee on October 11th. They committed to have him come in front of our committee. I hope they will honor their commitment. Jim Jordan outlines the forthcoming steps in the House GOP's investigation into Hunter Biden, promising relentless pursuit of the facts. I don't think they're gonna get any tax increases. The speaker and Republicans, we are clear, we're not raising Americans' taxes. For goodness sake, they've already been hit with the worst tax ever under Joe Biden, the inflation tax. So what, the Democrats wanna tax them more and make it worse? And, and look, I think Speaker McCarthy has handled this well. And I would just say this, who do you think's gonna get a better deal for the American people? Joe Biden, who has screwed up everything he's touched, border, inflation, energy policy, crime, you name it, foreign policy, or Speaker McCarthy, who went 15 rounds and emerged as the Speaker of the House. I actually think Speaker McCarthy in these negotiations and Republicans are going to get something that makes sense for the American people. Well, we're continuing to pursue from, from the judiciary standpoint, we're really going to look into this, uh, this plea agreement that was put together by the Justice Department. As I said in the hearing a few weeks ago, when we had the whistleblowers, Mr. Shapley and Mr. Ziegler come in and testify. I said then that the, the Department of Justice's story keeps changing. David Weiss told me in a letter on June 7th, I have complete authority to bring charges when I want, where I want, and whether I want to bring them at all. And then 23 days later, he sends me another letter and says, I want to, I want to uh, expand on what I wrote. I can only bring charges in my own uh, U.S. Attorney's District. Well, which is it, Mr. Weiss? You have full authority to bring them when, where, and whether, or just in your U.S. Attorney's District. So he's changed his story, but the whistleblowers haven't. And then this plea agreement that was put together that the judge said no to a week ago, I mean, I think that is hugely significant because they tried to hide information in the diversion part of the plea agreement instead of putting it in the plea agreement itself. And the judge caught him in what they were trying to do and said, time out, go figure this out. Um, so we're, we're looking to interview 11 people in the uh, Justice Department who were part of that investigation and figure out how, what, what was really going on here and the sweetheart deal they tried to put together. In a passionate defense of President Trump, Jim Jordan denounces any attempts at indictment as an assault on the champion of the American people and the nation's values. I mean, it's political, it's election interference, and it's wrong, and I think the country knows it. I think the result of that's gonna be, Maria, I think, I think President Trump's strength and, and is, is, only, is only, gonna, uh, only gonna harden and frankly expand. We knew the, the polling numbers uh, early last week were 54 to 17 in the Republican primary. President Trump's winning overwhelmingly. I bet those numbers right. go up. And, and the New York Times, the New York Times had him neck and neck with, with uh, a dead even race with Joe Biden, and that's the New York Times. So you know that's gonna go up as well because the country sees, all us normal folks, yeah. regular folks in flyover country, see what the, the elite in DC don't, that this is an attack on the guy who's, who's fighting for us, who's fighting for the American people, fighting for this great country. And uh, I think it only strengthens, hardens, and expands his support.
Well, the, the speaker has been clear as the evidence begins to mount. If we need to go to that phase of the investigation, then we're going to do it. It's a decision that the entire conference has to make. And certainly the evidence is piling up. All these you know, suspicious activity reports, the millions of dollars going to multiple members of the Biden family. And then, of course, you have Devin Archer's testimony from earlier this past week, where he lays out how all this all kind of fits together and the brand itself and then that meeting in Dubai. That's a lot of evidence. That's a lot of darn, I think, compelling evidence. So if we have to go to an impeachment inquiry phase, the speaker has been very clear. That's where the House Republicans will go. And we'll continue to do the work on behalf of the American people. The work we are required to do, by the way, under the Constitution as part of our duty to do oversight of the executive branch. Well, I would say maybe this is one of the first statements Secretary Clinton's made that I actually agree with. I do think it's a concern. Uh, and it's a concern because when you when you couple the way, you know, unfortunately, the way Joe Biden sort of conducts himself as president of the greatest country ever. And then you look at the policy, everything they've done is bad. Secure border to no border, record uh, safe streets to record uh, two dollar gas to five dollar gas, stable prices to record inflation now viewed weak around the world. And when it comes to foreign policy versus how we were viewed under President Trump, I don't know they've done anything right. And so when you couple all that with with the age concern that Secretary Clinton raised, I, I do. I do see why uh, even Democrats are questioning Joe Biden and whether he should run. What we're seeing from the tea leaves is that people are buying less, buying fewer goods, and they're being forced to spend mon more money on health care. So what we see here really is a double whammy of bad news. Brace yourselves for the shocking aftermath of the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse in Baltimore. The global economy trembles as U.S. supply chains suffer a catastrophic blow. But the other things are really problematic. Like you said, food and fuel. That's keeping inflation elevated. All right, the global economy and U.S. supply chains feeling the impact of the tragic collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore. Shipping giant Maersk stock closed down yesterday, although off of, uh, off of the lows when the company confirmed it was chartering the container ship that crashed into the bridge. The crash also shutting down the port of Baltimore's coal exports as ship traffic in and out of the area are suspended until further notice. Now, you said a long time ago you felt inflation was not going to go down, that it's, it was gonna going to stay down. elevated. But you also said, watch during an election year how uh, the powers that be manipulate the energy market and get oil prices lower. What's the impact now after this disaster on energy and commodities? The relentless push to sideline fossil fuels in favor of a climate change agenda drives oil prices skyward fueling a crisis that imperils the very backbone of our transportation infrastructure. Well, yeah, and it? you know, Bill, the underlying component here that is really the problem is what you just said, oil. And the fact is, is that when you have this climate change agenda that is pushing fossil fuels to the side, it's only pushing oil prices up. And so when you've got the price of oil going up, that is what is needed to transport the products. Well, every, uh, everything that President Biden has done to try to bring the energy prices down, uh, they were counter uh, uh, fought by the OPEC nations. And look, look what happened, what Iran did in the Red Sea, in the Suez Canal, uh, the uh, oil was blocked. As the wreckage of the Francis Scott Key Bridge paralyzes Baltimore's vital coal exports, the ominous ripple effects threaten to engulf the entire nation in economic turmoil. It's true, but we're still waiting for things to actually show the impact of 11 rate hikes. This morning, we got housing data. Actually, housing starts and housing permits were up, and a lot of people expected them to be down. So we still are looking at an economy that is growing, but growing slower and continuing to slow down going into next year. With ships diverted from Baltimore to New York Harbor and New Jersey, the once thriving city faces an existential threat, teetering on the brink of economic devastation. And, in, and uh, if they were afraid of President Biden, that they go in and use him and, and wipe out the hoodies and reopen the, the Red Sea, he would solve the problem. But he hasn't done so. And I, nobody understands why he hasn't done so. Uh, why do you allow a group to, to shut down the Red Sea, shut down the Suez Canal and create havoc on the prices of food and the prices of uh, oil. Yeah. So do you think that's what's going to happen? Because I know that in 2023, that port was the second busiest for coal exports. 
Uh, you also had top commodities uh, by weight in 2022 that were also important. Liquefied natural gas, waste paper, ferrous scrap, automobiles, light trucks. So this is all government data in terms of what, what comes through that port. The city of Baltimore is going to be devastated. And, um, uh, you know, we'll deal with it uh, because the, the ships, instead of going to Baltimore, they'll end up in uh, New York Harbor and, uh, and New Jersey. And uh, we'll deal with it. But we can't afford a second problem. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the bridge going down, it was a similar bridge that happened in, in Tampa, Florida, uh, that, uh, that went down. Uh, it was 13 20, people. 35 people in that time oh, in Tampa in 1980. Uh, and this bridge was not supported enough. You know, how you build it cheaply and uh, you, you just get it done. Desperation grips the nation as consumers, stretched thin and burdened by rising costs, plunge deeper into debt just to afford basic necessities like gas and food. You've got inflation staying elevated with, as you just said, input costs, the cost that producers pay. They usually pass it on to consumers. Those costs are going up at a time that retail sales, while up, are up lower than expected. The consumer is stretched. They're going into their credit cards. They're going into their 401ks. You've got several states now reporting credit card delinquencies are on the rise. So they can't afford to pay their credit card bills and they can't afford to pay for just simple essentials like gas and food. Joe Biden's failed administration bears the brunt of public outrage as higher taxes and rampant inflation spiral out of control, plunging the country into an abyss of economic despair. Yeah, I mean, Congressman, maybe, but it's if President Trump becomes president again, right? It's if, because I'm reading a story this morning from uh, The Federalist, and it's called Nine Ways the Feds Are Using Biden Bucks to Rig the 2024 Election. And it goes through all the federal agencies that Joe Biden has put on watch to actually engage voters and uh, supply voter registration services on agency premises. And that includes the Office of Personal Management, the Department of Education, the Department of he Health and Human Services, uh, the Department of Agriculture, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Labor, the Department of Interior, the Department of the Treasury. OK, so what are you all doing about it on the Republican side as the government, Biden's government, Biden's administration seems to be using a whole on government approach to get people to vote Democrat? Yeah, you know, and you've seen the weaponization of government. In fact, we set up a committee just to look into the weaponization of government. Uh, there are a lot of lawsuits when Joe Biden said, hey, we're going to waive student loan debt. Uh, that was taken to court. Ultimately, the court said, no, he can't do that. Uh, he's going to continue to push the envelope. Uh, and look, if the election was held today, uh, we would win. I think we'd run the table. Uh, the election's not today. It's eight months from now. And as you pointed out, I think they're going to pull out every stop. We need to be pulling out every stop as well. And we're going to do that. Uh, but I think the country's fed up. The country really doesn't like the direction under Joe Biden, under this failed administration, higher, uh, higher taxes, uh, which yields to the higher spending, higher inflation. People are paying more for everything. They're sick of it. They don't want an open border. They're watching chaos all around the world. All of our allies under attack by enemies. And Joe Biden's only made it worse. Biden's open border policies flood the nation with millions of undocumented immigrants annually, exacerbating economic woes and fueling a growing sense of disillusionment among the populace. I mean, this wide open border has obviously put national security at risk in this country. And the Supreme Court decision yesterday uh, also is something to discuss, given the fact that that was uh, impacting democracy. Give us your reaction to the SCOTUS decision and the wide open border today. Well, the border's wide open, Maria, as President Trump said, because Joe Biden wants it to be open. He promised in his campaign in 2020 that he would reverse all of President Trump's highly effective policies that had, in effect, closed our border. That's exactly what he did on day one. We've seen an invasion of our country ever since. 10 million illegal migrants have crossed our border. President Trump is also right that President Biden could close the border. At least he could substantially reduce the flow if he took a few simple steps. For instance, stop the abuse of parole authority. Barack Obama only paroled five or 6,000 people a year into the country. Joe Biden is approaching 2 million people a year. He could also just send the message to the rest of the world, don't come. If you do come, you won't get in. 
but he won't do that because his party is ideologically invested in open borders. That's why the American people have soured so badly on Joe Biden while President Trump is running ahead of him in virtually every poll. And the Democrats are resorting to legal warfare to try to keep President Trump off the ballot. Thankfully, the Supreme Court junked that yesterday. I think that you're also going to see President Trump winning most of these bogus cases against him. But it's a sad state of affairs when Joe Biden and the Democrats are so unpopular that they can't try to win at the ballot box. They can simply try to imprison their opponent, which is something that's more fitting for a country like Pakistan or Brazil than our great nation. It's not temporary. It's not hasn't been transitory. It has been a really uh, a three year period where consumers are feeling real pressure because they are seeing uh, prices uh, and seeing sticker shock because prices of everything are up. I will say this. Rent has stabilized. I spoke with Stephen Schwartzman the other day, the chairman of the Blackstone Group, who is the largest owner of commercial real estate in the world. He says, look, it takes a while for this to get through in terms of the headline number on CPI or PPI. Rent has stopped going up. This morning on Mornings with Marie, we had Jim Grant on, founder of the Grant's Interest Rate Observer. He said, I wouldn't be surprised if the Fed raises interest rates this year. I was like, whoa, that is so contrary. And that would obviously cause a big stock market sell up. I don't really buy into that. I don't think the Fed's going to raise rates. But for him to say that. Amid a faltering economy and skyrocketing inflation, Biden deflects blame and shirks responsibility, leaving a trail of broken promises and shattered dreams in his wake. Well, this is all very disturbing, obviously, Senator. And uh, I, I wonder what your thoughts are on what the president is spending his time doing. I mean, you've got a wide open border, as you say, 10 million um, illegals in this country on Biden's watch. You've got an economy that is teetering potentially uh, on recession later this year. We're seeing a growth slowdown, inflation at 40 year highs. We're still seeing inflation up 18 percent on Joe Biden's watch. And this morning he's talking about late fees and he's talking about corporate America. Uh, and, and it's companies fault that people are facing inflation. Is, is this all uh, sort of a preamble to the State of the Union on Thursday? Yeah, I think what you'll see in the State of the Union Thursday night, Maria, is a massive effort to shift blame. Because that's what Joe Biden seems to be doing most of the time, blaming other people for his own failures. He wants to blame Republicans for the fact that he opened our border and allowed this 10 million migrant invasion to occur. Or to blame Benjamin Netanyahu for being too tough on bloodthirsty in Gaza, when it's Joe Biden's weakness and appeasement of Iran and its proxies across the region that caused this to start in the first place. All Joe Biden seems to be doing lately is blaming others for his own failures. That's why the American people are prepared to repudiate him this fall, because he doesn't have any answers or solutions for them. He only has blame and bitterness for his own own failed presidency. Big mistake to do it, number one. I think it tells us that the consumer is stretched for them to reach into their retirement account and need money to pay for these essentials. All I want to say is this. I tell all my friends, the biggest secret and the easiest way to becoming a millionaire is your 401k plan. Do not go into your 401k plan sooner than retirement. Do not use that money. Let it build up and don't leave any money on the table. You work for a company that's willing to match the money dollar to dollar. Take it all. Don't leave any money on the table and don't go into your 401k. That is a sign of stress and that's not good. Though inflation shows signs of abating, Its lingering grip on the economy threatens to stifle growth and plunge the nation into a recession, casting a pall of uncertainty over the future. Well, good morning, Bill. That's exactly right. That took a big chunk out of this quarterly numbers for the retailers. Now, you mentioned Walmart. Walmart has something going for it. It's Walmart. A lot of people want to trade down to cheaper stuff. They don't want to be paying sky high prices for things. So Walmart is actually taking market share from other people. Walmart was able to report revenue was up five and a quarter percent. And same store sales were up 4.9 percent. It wasn't a great report. Obviously, the stock traded down because the guidance about what is coming next and next year was really what investors were focused on with the Walmart quarter. But you have to say Walmart is doing well compared to others because it's taking market share for that very reason. Because when you look at retail sales, they were up overall two and a half percent. 
But look at inflation. Even though it is way down from the highs of a year ago, inflation is still running at a clip of about three and a quarter percent. So the mixed story was just that for the retail earnings this quarter, Bill. We saw some positive surprises in some. People did uh, see a decline in luxury spending. They're trading down to places like Walmart. And the expectations for the future are also quite worrisome because partly there's going to be a resumption of student loan payments. Don't forget, that's going to ch- uh, take a chunk of uh, consumers' disposable and discretionary income or spending plans out of the mix because they have to pay those student loans. So there's that to worry about as well. Good news here, well, going into Thanksgiving, your Thanksgiving dinner is cheaper. It'll cost you about 4% less than last year. We'll take and that. And the price of a turkey is down 16% yeah. from a year ago. With taxpayer dollars funneled into partisan agendas, the ominous specter of political manipulation looms large, casting doubt on the integrity of our democratic institutions. So you, so you believe that the Republicans can do what the Democrats are doing in terms of getting out the vote? Because just one, one example, the Education Department uh, the, and, and its role in carrying out Biden's executive order. Uh, they are telling colleges and universities to make a good faith effort to make mail voter registration forms widely available to students and informed colleges that they may use work study funds, work study money. That's taxpayer money which are used to provide part-time campus jobs to help students with tuition costs. They can use that to pay students to support voter registration activities. They're using taxpayer yeah, money that is, to vote Democrat. You know that. Right. A lot of that's being challenged and will be yeah. challenged in the courts. One of the things, Maria, we've got to do, and, and look, this is something uh, that I think everybody recognizes this year. Uh, we have got to push our voters wherever the laws and in every state has laws that say you can vote early. We've got to push our voters to vote early because the other side's doing it. And if we just sit back and say, no, we're only going to vote on Election Day. I wish every state had only Election Day except for our military that were serving overseas. And you had to show picture ID. That's yeah. not the law in most states. And so wherever the law says, you know, you can vote three weeks early, we need to be encouraging our voters to vote early as well, because if they're banking 40 percent of the Democrat vote before Election Day and we're all waiting to Election Day and it might rain, you might have other issues, uh, you don't want to take that risk. And in fact, we won't win if we don't play by the rules. And that means maximizing the rules. Uh, just like they're going to do, we better be doing the same. I think the special counsel allows them to extend this out even further. This is an attack on the guy who's who's fighting for us, who's fighting for the American people, fighting for this great country. And uh, I think it only strengthens, hardens and expands his support. In a heart wrenching twist of fate, the political arena becomes the backdrop for Jim Jordan's valiant struggle. A fight that, despite his best efforts, ends in bitter defeat. Now we're going to Capitol Hill, where House Republicans will try again today to break that deadlock over electing a new Speaker of the House. Trump ally Jim Jordan still does not have enough votes. He's still vowing to fight on. As Nicole Killian reports, the divisions among the GOP members were on full display. Yeah, the second round, not the charm for him, Matt. In fact, he lost more Republican votes than he did in the first attempt yesterday. He flipped two members for him, but four turned against him that voted yesterday for him. And as a result, 22 members in total of the Republican conference did not vote for Jim Jordan for speakers. We're back with the chaos on Capitol Hill. The House still without a speaker after the GOP's nominee, Jim Jordan, fell short of the votes he needs from fellow Republicans. And now, as Ryan Nobles tells us, Jordan's fight will stretch into another day. I want to just pick up on that point in that last question that I asked Lawler about whether or not there were any conversations being had with these eight Republicans, because the argument that many Republicans make is that, look, 96 percent of our conference backed Kevin McCarthy. It's these four percent. And if you think about math, because everything we're talking about up here has to do with math. A Jordan spokesperson has said he does not intend to drop out of the race at this point, but we'll see if the pressure builds on him, seeing that he actually lost some of the support he had yesterday. The things are getting worse for him, it seems, not better at this point, Matt, and the House is still left stagnant in the meantime. The stage is set for an electrifying showdown as the political heavyweights engage in a battle of wits and wills. 
with Jim Jordan's ambitions hanging in the balance. Yeah, well, uh, Jim Jordan did lose uh, two additional votes. Obviously, he there were 20 who voted against him yesterday, now 22 today, although uh, he did flip some people for him, but also oh. more against him. So, uh, you know, this is really kind of a changing tide as we uh, continue to kind of witness uh, the fallout from this. I did just a short time ago ask the GOP conference chair, Elise Stefanik, kind of what the next step is now that the House is once again adjourned. She did not uh, respond, but I did have a chance to speak with Congressman Mike Lawler of New York. He is someone who on both of these rounds has voted for former House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Uh, he told me that that was his plan uh, even prior to these votes several days ago. He said that he believes that McCarthy really was uh, the best qualified for uh, the job. Well, there's been a growing conversation about that, Matt, about expanding, expanding the pro tem uh, powers of the interim speaker, basically, Patrick McHenry. That is something, though, that would require Democratic support. And a lot of Republicans are reluctant because they might have to make concessions to Democrats in order to actually get that happen. It is not something it seems that largely the Republican conference wants to pursue. And yet the longer this goes on, it may become a more likely option, given that Congress and the House has pretty pressing things to deal with, including funding for Israel, as well as trying to avoid a government shutdown down after that deadline of November 17th. So we'll see if that motion is indeed filed today to expand the powers of McHenry. That's something we're going to be watching very closely in the hours ahead. The spotlight narrows on the high stakes drama as Jim Jordan navigates the treacherous landscape of politics, desperately seeking victory. Wouldn't it potentially be easier to flip some of those eight versus 22 who have now voted against Jordan? So I think that is one dynamic to watch, even though McCarthy has said many times that, you know, he doesn't want to be nominated again. He's not putting his hat in the, you know, in the ring. But at the same token, he did at one point a few weeks ago kind of crack that door open that if the conference were to renominate him, he'd be open to it. So not saying that that is an option going forward, but it is one to watch. It seems like it could be one on the table for now. And the more immediate, though, uh, there seems to be growing consensus and momentum that it's time to move forward with McHenry. I also talked to Congressman Mike Gallagher a short time ago as well off camera. He is someone who uh, has also been mentioned as a possible consensus candidate. Uh, he's from Wisconsin. He's been working on this uh, select committee uh, with respect to China. Um, very big national security hawk. Uh, but he told me he doesn't want the job. Uh, and so even though people are throwing his name out there, because I know we hear a different name every day, he yeah. confirmed that that he has no interest. And he really made an interesting analogy saying, you know, there are so many fires right now uh, that are going on and that, you know, we as a Republican conference are, are you know, like firemen in the firehouse trying to put out these fires, but yet we can't figure out who's going to run. And that really kind of, I think, encapsulates the dilemma that Republicans are in right now. They talk to Hunter Biden's defense counsel and say, let's extend the statute of limitations. And then at some point they made an intentional decision to say, we're going to let the statute of limitations lapse. And I want to know who decided that and why they did it. Mr. Weiss was a supervisor of the investigation at that time and at all times. He made the necessary appropriate decisions. You'll be able to ask him that question and he will. You know why they did it. Everyone knows why they did it. May not say it, but everyone knows why they did it. They didn't, the Baris, those tax years, that's that, that dealt with the, pre, that involved the president. It's one thing to have a in charge in Delaware. That doesn't involve the president of the United States. But Burisma, oh my, that goes right to the White House. We can't have that. And we can slow walk this thing along. We can even extend the statute of limitations and then we can intentionally let it lapse. And we know this investigation was slow. Here's what everyone said. Shapley said, DOJ slow walked the investigation. Ziegler, slow walking in the approvals of everything. This happened at the Delaware's attorney's office and DOJ tax level. Mr. Sobosinski, the FBI agent said, I would have liked to th see things move faster. Ms. Holly said the same. Every witness we've talked to said this thing was slow walked and we know why. It was slow walked it long enough to let the statute of limitations run so they wouldn't have to get into Burisma. But the fates have a different plan. With the tension palpable, the audience is drawn into a whirlwind of emotions, cheering for Jordan's success 
while fearing the impending disappointment. Well, you would think particularly when supposedly David Weiss goes, and this is a testimony we've got, David Weiss goes to the U.S. attorney in the District of Columbia and he declines to allow him to prosecute there. You would think the attorney general would weigh in then, but it looks like he didn't. Now he's weighing in with the special counsel. The other thing I think is happening here in this third plan, I think the special counsel allows him to extend this out even further. So we'll see what that all means. David Weiss is scheduled to be in front of our committee on October 11th. They committed to have him come in front of our committee. I hope they will honor their commitment. I don't think they're gonna get any tax increases. The speaker and Republicans, we are clear, we're not raising Americans' taxes. For goodness sake, they've already been hit with the worst tax ever under Joe Biden, the inflation tax. So what, the Democrats wanna tax them more and make it worse? And, and look, I think Speaker McCarthy has handled this well. And I would just say this, who do you think is going to get a better deal for the American people? Joe Biden, who has screwed up everything he's touched, border, inflation, energy policy, crime, you name it, foreign policy, or Speaker McCarthy, who went 15 rounds and emerged as the Speaker of the House. I actually think Speaker McCarthy in these negotiations and Republicans are going to get something that makes sense for the American people. The number one thing we got to do this Congress is not reauthorize FISA in its current form. We have to have dramatic changes to FISA. This is one of the primary focuses of House Republicans on the Judiciary Committee, and I think, frankly, House Republicans, period. So we got to focus on that. And then, of course, the appropriations process. There is no way the FBI should get a new headquarters. There's all kinds of other restrictions we should place on American tax dollars that go to the Department of Justice. Those are our primary focuses. And I think today from Mr. Durham, you will hear why that is necessary, because he's going to give detail and add more color to to what we already knew, that this, this whole Trump-Russia thing was a lie. The dossier was garbage. They used it anyway. They used it to go spy on an American citizen for American citizens associated with the presidential campaign. So that will come out, I think, in a, in a clear form. And there'll be, as I said, some real detail added to what we sort of know already happened. But in my mind, it's all moving us towards the goal of not reauthorizing FISA in its current form, dramatically changing that, and limiting how American tax dollars are spent at the Department Department of Justice. This unforgettable moment becomes a pivotal chapter in the ongoing political saga, leaving spectators and participants alike in suspense as they grapple with the consequences of a failed campaign. Total attack on the First Amendment. You got Facebook saying, can you change uh, the, the government saying to Facebook, can you change the algorithm to limit the reach, to limit the speech of conservatives like Tommy Lahren, like the Daily Wire, like Fox News? I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. It's wrong. And we've caught him now. Thank goodness we got the information first from Elon Musk when he released what was happening at Twitter, the whole Twitter files. And then we had to push Facebook threat and contempt. Uh, because they weren't complying with the subpoena. And finally, we get the information and we see what we exactly what we thought was happening, which is Facebook was doing the same darn thing uh, from from uh, the pressure from the government. And they did it because they wanted to keep a cozy relationship with the Biden administration. I mean, you even had one of the executives at Facebook say that this is this is encroaching on First Amendment uh, free expression. I mean, they knew it was wrong. They did it anyway because the White House was was pushing him so hard and they wanted to keep their relationship with the Biden administration. That's how bad this was. And thank goodness for that decision in the in the federal court in the Western District of Louisiana, where they laid all this out, all these various agencies and the White House pressuring big tech to limit first America, uh, uh, Americans, First Amendment free speech rights is in 86 pages of like facts they lay out in that, that decision from the court. Um, it's really bad, and, it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm so glad we've done the work and we've been able to show the American people just how serious this coercion and pressure was from, uh, from the Biden White House and the Biden administration. In a narrative rife with ambition and setbacks, Jim Jordan's journey becomes a symbol of resilience and determination, even in the face of defeat. Well, we're continuing to pursue, from, from the judiciary standpoint, we're really going to look into this uh, this plea agreement that was put together by the Justice Department. As I said in the hearing a few weeks ago, when we had the whistleblowers, Mr. Shapley and Mr. Ziegler, come in and testify, I said then that the, the Department of Justice's story keeps changing. David Weiss told me in a letter on June 7th, I have complete authority to bring charges when I want, where I want, and whether I want to bring them at all. And then 23 days later, he sends me another letter and says, I want to, I want to uh, expand on what I wrote. I can only bring charges in my own uh, U.S. Attorney's District 
Well, which is it, Mr. Weiss? You have full authority to bring him when, where, and whether, or just in your U.S. Attorney's District. So he's changed his story, but the whistleblowers haven't. And then this plea agreement that was put together that the judge said no to a week ago, I mean, I think that is hugely significant because they tried to hide information in the diversion part of the plea agreement instead of putting it in the plea agreement itself. And the judge caught him in what they were trying to do and said, time out, go figure this out. Um, so we're, we're looking to interview 11 people in the uh, Justice Department who were part of that investigation and figure out how, what, what was really going on here and the sweetheart deal they tried to put together. We want to know about the correspondence. We know that the, the National School Boards Association had contacts with the Department of Education, the White House and the Justice Department prior to ever sending that initial letter on September tw uh, 29th, 2021. And then just five days later on October 4th, there's a memorandum that's put out by the Attorney General of the United States that does exactly what the memorandum, or excuse me, from the letter, does exactly what the letter from the School Boards Association asked the White House to do. We want to know all the coordination that took because we just we think this was hatched ahead of time. The letter simply became the pretext for the White House and the Justice Department to do what they wanted to do. Now, remember, guys, they thought this was going to help Terry McAuliffe become governor of Virginia. It actually backfired and it wound up helping Glenn Youngkin win that win that election and is now, of course, the governor of, of the great state of Virginia. So they thought it was going to help them politically. That's why the turnaround was so quick in putting this all together. As the story unfolds, the bitter taste of Jim Jordan's political setback serves as a powerful reminder of the unpredictable and unforgiving nature of the political landscape. I mean, it's political, it's election interference, and it's wrong, and I think the country knows it. I think the result of that's gonna be, Maria, I think I think President Trump's strength and, and is, is only is only gonna uh, only gonna harden and frankly expand. We knew the, the polling numbers uh, early last week were 54 to 17 in the Republican primary. President Trump's winning overwhelmingly. I bet those numbers right. go up. And, and the New York Times, the New York Times had him neck and neck with with uh, a dead even race with Joe Biden. And that's the New York Times. So, you know, that's going to go up as well because the country sees all us normal folks, yeah. regular folks in flyover country. See what the, the elite in D.C. don't that this is an attack on the guy who's who's fighting for us, who's fighting for the American people, fighting for this great country. And uh, I think it only strengthens, hardens, and expands his support. Well, the, the speaker has been clear as the evidence begins to mount, if we need to go to that phase of the investigation, then we're gonna do it. It's a decision that the entire conference has to make. And certainly the evidence is piling up. All these you know, suspicious activity reports, the millions of dollars going to multiple members of the Biden family. And then of course you have Devin Archer's testimony from earlier this past week, where he lays out how all this all kind of fits together and the brand itself, and then that meeting in Dubai. That's a lot of evidence. That's a lot of darn, I think, compelling evidence. So if we have to go to an impeachment inquiry phase, the speaker has been very clear. That's where the House Republicans will go, and we'll continue to do the work on behalf of the American people. The work we are required to do, by the way, under the Constitution as part of our duty to do oversight of the executive branch. Well, I would say maybe this is one of the first statements Secretary Clinton's made that I actually agree with. I do think it's a concern. Uh, and it's a concern because when you when you couple the, the way, you know, unfortunately, the way Joe Biden sort of conducts himself as president of the greatest country ever. And then you look at the policy, everything they've done is bad. Secure border to no border, record uh, safe streets to record uh, two dollar gas to five dollar gas, stable prices to record inflation now viewed weak around the world. And when it comes to foreign policy versus how we were viewed under President Trump, I don't know they've done anything right. And so when you couple all that with with the age concern that Secretary Clinton raised, I, I do I do see why uh, even Democrats are questioning Joe Biden and whether he should run.